Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first annual Forge uh, Redemptive Entrepreneurship Pitch Competition. Uh, really glad that all of you are here. My name is Travis Pickell, and I am the Associate Director of University Engagement at Anselm House, uh, the sponsoring organization or one of the sponsoring organizations for this competition. For those of you who are new to us, Anselm House is a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota dedicated to bringing together faith and life faith and knowledge with all of life uh, at the university and beyond. And tonight's competition is one really exciting way that we are proposing to do that in this uh, time of COVID-19 as we uh, attempt to try new things with our uh, activities and programs at the university. One thing that we really got excited about thinking about was supporting individuals and teams who Uh, really want to think well and creatively about what it means to bring together faith and knowledge in the area of entrepreneurship and business creation and venture creation, which is one really amazing way uh, for people to engage God's world and to make a uh, difference within it uh, using their creativity and um, their gifts. So tonight's competition uh, is the culmination of a months long process for many of these teams of preparation. Um, We have six teams tonight uh, who are going to compete for over $10,000 worth of prize money, as well as an opportunity to attend the Praxis Labs Academy, um, which I'll say more about at the conclusion of our time. And so, I'm really excited for all of you to come and to support the teams. There'll be opportunities for you to engage. Um, If you want, you can use the chat function to interact with one another about the ideas that you see. And you can um, log your questions in the Q&A function. And uh, if the judges decide that they're good ones, the judges may decide to to, uh, ask the participants to speak to them during the Q&A portion after each presentation. So tonight's um, competition is a partnership between Anselm House and a number of different entities around the Twin Cities and beyond. Um, We've partnered with Innove Studios, the Gary Holmes Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Minnesota. And we've also partnered with two um, organizations particularly. Uh, One is Praxis Labs, which is a uh, incubator and and organization dedicated to what is called redemptive entrepreneurship, which they define as creative restoration through sacrifice, which is a model that we've uh, taken up with Forge as a way of um, thinking about bringing together faith and entrepreneurial activities. And so we we thank them for partnering with us. And we also thank um, IDEOS, which is a nonprofit that helps ventures build their what what they call empathic capacities um, or empathic intelligence around um, serving the people that they will interact with through their ventures. And so both Praxis and IDEOS have given uh, very practically to the mission of Forge by interacting with the teams Um, and offering counseling and coaching throughout this process. And so um, we think that that's really valuable and we wanna thank them on the front end of this um, competition. I also wanna acknowledge and name our business mentors uh, here in the Twin Cities who've joined up with each of the teams to help them develop their ventures and their, particularly their pitches for tonight's competition. Um, By name, I'll just say um, each of their names, uh, Greg Silker with Silker Studios, Emily Soltvet with River Bridge Partners, Karen Brown with Edge Consulting, Chad Gauger with Cargill, Luke Cahill with Real Insights, and Kyle Hamilton with Nuru. Um, So we thank you all business mentors for uh, entering into uh, the the process here with Forge and for supporting these teams. And I really hope that those um, relationships thrive even beyond the competition. Tonight, each team will have six minutes to pitch a a redemptive venture um, that they would like seed funding for um, that we are willing to offer in the amount of $7,500. $7,500. And in addition to that, they'll be comp- competing for an audience choice prize that you, the audience, will get a chance to, to vote on. Um, at the conclusion of the presentations, 
I'll, I'll just go ahead and give you the, the URL now in case you want to pull it up, but we ask that you wait till the conclusion of the presentations before you vote. Um, but you can go to forgecompetition.com forward slash vote. So forgecompetition.com forward slash vote, and you can vote for the audience choice award at the end of the um, six presentations tonight. At this point, I'd like to introduce our judges panel. Um, so I'll invite them to turn on their video cameras right now. Um, we have three uh, esteemed judges with us tonight. Uh, ben Carlson is a local entrepreneur here in the Twin Cities. Um, he's had a, a, a history of helping to start ventures here, including Seven Corners Coffee near the U. Uh, he now owns and operates Long Miles Coffee, an international and multinational coffee farming collaborative working in three countries, maybe four countries uh, in, the, in the near future. It's, it's growing. And, um, and so we're really grateful to have him and his experience tonight. Thank you, Ben, for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Travis. Looking yeah. forward to this. Me too. Uh, we also have Fred Rose, who, after a long career in both computing, computer engineering and nonprofit leadership, moved to the University of Minnesota, where he helped to found ACARA, a student social entrepreneurship incubator and competition within the University of Minnesota Institute on the Environment, um, which is a really great program. Students who are watching, we encourage you to, to check that out uh, in addition to this particular program, if that's something that sounds interesting to you. So thank you, Fred, for being with us. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, best of luck to everybody. Great. And finally, we have John Halverson, who's a partner at Talenton Advisors and Impact Investing Fund, which invests in mid-sized growth stage companies in the developing world with values-driven CEOs and management teams. Uh, and uh, John, we're really grateful that you would join us as well. It's just wonderful to be here and uh, looking forward to the presentations. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we did have a, a fourth judge who I just want to name. She was not able to be here because of a family emergency, but because her venture is so uh, cool, basically, I just wanted to be able to mention it uh, here. Leah Hernandez, who was uh, going to be joining us as a, as a judge tonight, is a Praxis Academy and Emerging Founder alum and the founder and CEO of Young Authors Publishing. You might want to Google that at some point. It's really neat. It's a not-for-profit children's book publisher that exists to share the stories of children, many of whom live in underserved and underrepresented communities. And so um, we're sad that she's not able to be here with us, but we were grateful that she was um, desiring to be a part of this. And so at this point, I'm gonna ask the judges to uh, turn off their cameras and I'm going to invite our first uh, team to join us. Uh, that is Peter Brimehurst and Tyler Dick, who are um, vet students here at the U and they are pitching vet tales. Take it away. Thank you, Travis. I remember entering veterinary school almost with excitement ready to face any challenge that came my way. Within a few short months, that excitement had already switched to dread. I dreaded getting up the next day to grind in a textbook. I dreaded feeling the desire to make myself a real meal and then being disappointed knowing I didn't have the time to. I dreaded the feeling that I had no time for important things like dating relationships, family, or my community. They were disappearing out of my life quicker than I had time to redeem them. I was studying the same ways I did in undergrad, which were inefficient and time consuming. I ended up clawing my way through a steep learning curve that just exhausted me by my third year. Although this isn't my exact story, it is the story many of our classmates are telling us. Vet school presents students with a challenge unlike anything they have ever seen. We often liken it to drinking from a fire hose. This is accompanied with a narrative that makes it even harder to succeed. Just ask about any veterinary student about their life and you'll hear the stressful narrative, school is miserable and you need to make major sacrifices to survive. Once this lie is believed, students end up exploiting themselves by sacrificing many things that matter to them, including faith, family, personal health, and relationships. Students are stuck. The American Veterinary Medical Association veterinary pharmaceutical companies, and many universities are pouring thousands of dollars into researching how poor our mental health is every year. 
We are balancing on the knife edge of a mental health crisis. After digging more into this problem, we found that this narrative can be successfully flipped if you can reduce the number of hours spent on school in any given week. When students get more time, they spend it well, like with family or working out. Digging further, we found that the classes that require lots of memorization were huge time black holes. Students could spend over 25 hours studying for a single test and still feel unprepared. For example, in one class at the University of Minnesota, veterinary students need to memorize 185 pathogens. Even if there's a measly 10 facts per pathogen, that's still over 1800 facts for that one class alone. As we've gone through veterinary school, we've learned that there are better ways to study, which reduce our time spent on materials while simultaneously increasing the length of our memory. This is where Vet Tales comes in. Students need a proven study technique that will reduce their time studying while increasing the amount they retain and the length for which they retain it. Vet Tales provides students with pre-constructed memory palaces from which students can study. If I were to list off that cats are predisposed to diabetes mellitus if they are obese and that they need a blood glucose reading over 270 to distinguish stress hyperglycemia from diabetes and fructose means the best diagnostic test in cats and that dogs only need blood glucose levels of over 200 and you get the picture. The list goes on for just this single disease and just diagnosing it. An easy way to remember these few facts is a fat cat sitting on a pipe saying 270 makes the stressed pipes blow to help you remember the glucose level for cats and that obesity makes cats more likely to get diabetes. And an angry pineapple hat to remember that fructosamine or fruit omine is a diagnostic test for cats and a dog eating a cake in the shape of a 200 to remember their glucose level. Oh, and dogs and cats get extra hungry when they have diabetes. As you can see, there's a lot more built into these pictures than we have time to explain. Now, after hearing this description and looking at these two images, close your eyes. You'll be surprised at how much you remember about canine and feline diabetes. This study technique has proven itself over and over, but students don't have the time to create quality memory palaces on their own, but vet tales can. The company will be focused on tackling the toughest classes from the first through third years of veterinary school. The delivery method will be a narrated video that has cartoon memory hooks appear as the narrator describes the connection to the medical fact in a grand story that connects all the facts for that disease together. They will be delivered to our customers through an online platform courses that will sell the videos paired with a memory palace quiz. What does the angry pineapple hat mean? A medical topic quiz. What molecule do you measure to diagnose feline diabetes? And a parallel fact sheet. Top 20 facts you need to know about cat diabetes. This will be bolstered after company launch by a physical copy of a workbook to take notes in. Our market size is about 13,300 students in the US with potentially about 10,000 more in Canada, the UK, and Australia. The tips will be charged students at $10 per hour of material. Each hour of video costs about $1,000 to produce. Our next investments will be used to finish production of our endocrinology video set, set up our web-based platform, and help cover legal costs associated with starting our business. Here is our leadership team, including Tyler, myself as co-founders, Bernard as our graphic designer, and Dr. Peggy Root as our advisor. With Vet Tales, we hope to redeem the narrative vet students tell themselves. We want to give smarter studies techniques that free up time to allow students to live a better life. We want to infuse hope into a profession filled with stress. Thank you for listening. All right, that's lovely. I'm gonna go, go ahead and invite our judges to join us again. And we have four minutes of rapid fire Q&A. Um, and so uh, Peter and Tyler, um, I'd like to introduce you to, to Ben, John, and Fred, who are going to be asking you questions. Go on, guys. Well, I'll, I'll jump in right away. And my, my, first, my first question is, I, well, first off, that, that was very enthusiastic. I, I, didn't, I didn't expect that. Well done, guys. Um, very, very fun to watch. I loved your graphics. Great job on that. Um, my, my first question, though, is, you know, that, that 
how are you going to actually market this to these 13,000 vet students? So the typical marketing scheme used in vet school is a representative on campus. We are planning to contact student representatives for us um, as we are a shoestring startup and that we can give them as compensation part of the package or the study set. So then we will have a contact on the 32 campuses in the United States. Yeah, and we'll identify natural leaders um, through different organizations to make sure we're identifying strong leaders and respected students um, to help deliver our messages. That's great, thanks. Yeah, this is John Halverson. Um, again, super, super interesting and creative idea. Um, I'm wondering if there is what the space looks like in general. Is there is there any competition for this or is this are you guys kind of the first movers? Um, and number one and number two, how do you execute on that pricing model of $10 an hour? Yeah, um, so the current competition is um, there's nobody in the veterinary field like this. There's no um, third party study resources that are creating videos or um, memory pal using memory palace techniques. Um, the only two competitors that you could potentially say we have are the Navli Prep um, services, which is a licensing exam that all veterinary students take. Um, but those um, companies focus on um, repeating multiple choice questions over and over. Um, so you just get super good at taking Navli questions um, in order to pass that board exam. Do you mind repeating the second question? Yeah, I'm wondering how, you know, with a small team that you're super busy, how do you capture and how do you kind of execute on the $10 an hour pricing model? So the $10 an hour pricing model will, there is a lot of work on the front end for this company and our graphic designer and us, we are all part of the founding team. And so what we will do is we will front end the work so that the $10 pricing hour is after the videos are created. And then we know how long that set of videos is for the class. So endocrinology is going to be roughly three and a half hours long. So that would be a $35 class that you can sign up for and it would be a front payment. Okay, so it's more like a fixed price per product than an hourly model, kind of, right? Correct. Okay, okay. Thanks. Maybe before Fred jumps on there, I have one other question too. Is this, do you, do you have any thoughts or is there, is there a way, way that you could scale this to maybe incorporate dental school or a chiropractic school or other kind of higher learning? Have you ever thought of doing something like that? Yes. So there is heavy competition in the medical dental worlds already that do something very similar to this. Um, and that is part of the way that we got this idea. Um, one of the places that it is not is in a lot of animal science training or in veterinary technician training. And that would be another scalable location that we would look to after completing the veterinary side. And are those other models in the, in the, in the medical world, um, in the dental world, are they successful? Do you know, are they, are they showing profitable results in this kind of field? One, yeah. one model just had a $30 million investment into them from a venture firm. Thank wow. you. So um, we only have a little bit of time left here, but a quick question. So your, your insight here, is the creation of these memory palaces. So that's what you guys are really doing and, and trying to monetize it through this process. Yep, that's, that's correct. correct. We're, we're creating memory palaces and then presenting them through a video format. So you have to create all of these hundreds or thousands of ideas and connect all of these different facts to some some sort of memory device, right? So that's Correct. what you... But there are repeating symbols throughout. Um, so one thing that we're gonna be doing is as we progress through our series of videos, um, the same item or same uh, fact will show up as the same um, uh, memory palace object. So say um, you have milk and, or calcium, I'm sorry, 
as your thing that you want to remember. We can use milk for that. And then there's hypocalcemia, there's hypercalcemia, there's all these different conditions that incorporate calcium. And we use the same symbol for that um, in whatever video we make to okay. help keep it consistent for viewers. Okay, got it, thanks. All right, thank you, Peter and Tyler. And thank you, judges. I'm gonna thank go you. ahead and invite Wu to um, join us at this point. Hello, Wu. And Wu is a PhD student in rehabilitation science, and she's going to be sharing light in the well with us. Take it away, Wu. Thank you, Travis. Good evening. My name is Yue Wu. My venture is called Light in the Well, a not-for-profit organization with a mission to transform lives and influence culture through exceptional music experiences that inspire and connect people with and without developmental disabilities. In my work as a music therapist, I encountered many people with developmental disabilities. For many of them, verbal communication can be challenging, but they can freely and creatively express themselves through music. The problem is twofold. On one hand, many people with developmental disabilities feel excluded from activities their non-disabled peers participate in. They describe that feeling as living in a while. On the other hand, people without developmental disabilities do not know how to interact with those that do. However, there is light in the well. Music is a way to bridge the gap. These are four real people that are thriving because of music therapy. Music provides a mechanism for this, for them to achieve their potential. My vision is to improve personal interactions between people with and without developmental disabilities to have fun and connect through music. To start, we will launch a multi-sensory event that includes original orchestrated music, creative storytelling, interactive music making, light, and learning to sing a song of acceptance at the end of the performance. This event will be held at McPhail Center for Music for 200 audience. Moving forward, Light in the Well will develop a community music therapy program provide music therapy and the continuing education services. We've done our research on the market. Here you can see in the Twin Cities alone, if only 1.5% of people with developmental disabilities and their family members participate in our venture, we will have the potential to connect with over 3,000 people. With the growing desire for diversity, equity, and inclusion, we expect to reach many more people without disabilities through schools and local businesses. We are starting our first year with the pilot multi-sensory event. And in year two, we'll expand to other locations and launch the community music therapy program. As far as the financial goes, we will sell tickets for $10 in person and $5 online. As you can see in the chart, in the yellow boxes, we will have revenue of about $2,400 and expenses of $15,000. After the grants that I already received, this leads to a loss of slightly over $4,000, which the prize money will more than offset. And I will use the remainder to launch the community music therapy program in year two. There's more detail behind the numbers in the appendix. The competitive landscape includes organizations using creative arts to empower people with disabilities and provide them a sense of purpose and belonging. Most of these organizations have a focused audience of family members of the people they serve. What's missing is an organization that brings people with and without developmental disabilities into the same space to make music together and tell the redemptive stories in people's lives. Another huge unmet need is the spiritual needs of people with developmental disabilities. For leadership, we have people with developmental disabilities and their family members on board, as well as a 
disability policy expert, music therapist, marketing and finance specialist, and a board of advisors. Music connects all of us. My vision is to improve personal interactions between people with and without disabilities, to connect through music, experiencing the richness of these diverse friendships. Well-being should be comprehensive, not only meeting the physical needs, but also the social, emotional, and the spiritual needs. Here are our anchors for the operating model and the leadership intent. First, do it with. We'll make sure all decisions are made with people with developmental disabilities. Second, God-centered. We'll honor God by loving one another and keeping each other accountable as a team. That's reach in. We'll bring services to people instead of waiting for them to come to us. That's reach out. We'll align our mission with God's will. That's reach up. Third, hope focused. We want to build a culture that restores the damage of division with hope and foster relationships and engage conversations via music. Fourth, serve. We will practice daily laying down our selfish ambitions to respond to God's calling in loving, serving, and reaching others. My venture will bring light and connection to people with and without developmental disabilities. The light is the hope and the resilience of the families that are affected by disabilities. They are the well of treasure for us to dig into and draw out. Come to the well and you will see the light of life from you and me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wu. Appreciate it. That was great. Lovely. All right. Invite our judges back. And um, what questions do you have for Wu? Um, yeah, this is Fred. I'll start this time. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand what happens at the event and, and how you help the interaction between people with development disability and others. Could yes. you just explain that a little bit, please? Yes. So for this performance, we will have people with developmental disabilities be part of the performance. And they themselves will narrate it, their own stories on stage. And we will ask the audience to make music when we say, what do you feel when you hear this? And they will use music to express their feelings through instrument playing, sound making, or singing. And, and how do you find the, um, the people with uh, the performers? Are they um, clients or you know, how, how do you find those people? Yes, they are the featured families right now are clients I'm working with, which are the four people you saw on the second slide. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, woo, this is uh, John Halverson. Um, great presentation, thank you. Um, have you piloted this yet, even on a small scale? I'd love to, you know, know what you've learned uh, thus far in terms of just the efficacy, the value proposition, and kind of the desired outcomes, the impact that you really want to get out of this. Have you piloted that yet? A little bit. I started with talking to organizational level leaders. And most of them are really enthusiastic and want to invite us and donate their space for us to use, to invite us to come to perform there. And also talk to human resource experts and they will give me these ideas about now DEI, the diversity, equity and inclusion is really uh, on the high topic. And they think this will be a great way to bridge the gap because when people talk about DEI, disability often is out of the conversation. Quick follow-up question: Is is there is there some strengths in bringing people together in a group setting? Is that one of the main building community? Is that kind of one of your main impact focuses? Is is that I'm trying to understand how that's better than kind of one-on-one -on -one and individual therapy? Yes. First of all, the problem is people with disabilities they don't feel they are included in lives of other people. So bringing this together as a group will help each other to learn from each other, befriend with each other. Okay, 
what if somebody likes hard rock and somebody else likes orchestral Beethoven? Yeah, we can provide all sorts of music because for music therapy, we'll really meet where the client is. So we basically can bring all sorts of in instrument and we can have people take turn. They can bang on the drum or they can just do some instrumental uh, melodic instruments. Okay, good, thanks. Thank you. Well, that was really good. This is Ben. Um, I, I really liked, I could really hear the redemptive vision in your pitch. I think that was a very strong um, component of what you're presenting. I'm, I'm just wondering um, kind of two questions. First, in, in the age of COVID, how have you thought about running these events to kind of facilitate, looks like a, a large part of your uh, income stream is going to come from events. Do you account for that and the spacing and, and maybe you could speak into that? Yes. So for the in-person, we have both in-person and online because of COVID. So people can really access from everywhere in the world to do this online stream. But for in-person part and partnership with McPhail Center for Music, they are one of the partners who would like to in-kind donate their space for us to do a live show there. I think that's that's great. And then I guess maybe another question is have and I'm maybe I missed it in the in your business model, but just is there an idea that you could get some of these families with with someone that would you could use this kind of therapy into kind of a subscription service or like a reoccurring um, way to keep them apart and um, like a long term commitment kind of a thing? Is that a part of your business plan? Yes. Maybe I missed it. I'm sorry. I didn't. No, that's okay. It's for the leadership part. We have people already. They are signed up. They are on board with this plan. Okay. And then clients, can clients be a part of that too? Can clients yes. be? Okay. So people with right. dis developmental disabilities are part of the leadership and we will okay. involve them with all the decisions we make. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. That concludes our Q&A time with Wu. Well done. Thank you for uh, your wonderful presentation. I'm now going to invite Samuel to join us. Samuel is a uh, MBA student at the Carlson School, and he is going to be um, presenting on uh, investing in the next generation. Go ahead, Samuel. So my slide is about uh, investing in young people. So what on earth do goats have to do with it? Uh, let me ask you a question. What do you think when you hear the words, I need a job that pays well? Do you think of uh, self-reliance, freedom, pride, taking care of your family? Do you think of a nice house, serving others for survival? Now imagine having those strong heartfelt desires but knowing down inside that regardless of your willingness to work hard, you had no chance in hell. My wife and I were uh, packing up our bags uh, for a flight back to the United States when Jane, a 19-year-old girl in rural Kenya, came pleading for something to do to earn some money and buy food for our family. This was not new. Several young people came asking for work during our stay in Kenya. This time, we had absolutely nothing for Jane to do. So, we gave uh, uh, the few uh, dollars we had, uh, but these experiences uh, never left our minds. We were deeply moved uh, with compassion. Our passion is to serve God, combi uh, combating joblessness and hopelessness among young people in Kenya through leveraging their creative energy in generating vitally needed income. We will accomplish this by making a good meat affordable for more Kenyans, fulfilling uh, the high demand by increasing uh, production through crossbreeding, information, and genomic technology. Goat meat is a delicacy in Kenya, lean, low in saturated fat. Therefore, it's preferred and consumed by, by, consumed by more than 15 million people. It is attractive to high income health con conscious customers, but at $5.38 per kilo, which is two pounds, it is unaffordable for most people. Growing up in Kenya, our family of six, I could remember we could only afford about 
a pound of meat per month and things have not gotten better. Demand is high, but production is low due to poor investment in the entire business chain from unplanned and uncontrolled breeding uh, methods all the way to the grocery store. Almost 70% of all goat meat in East Africa is done in an arid, semi-arid lands by shepherds where the animals are generally exposed to harsh environmental conditions to determine uh, their performance. The solution is we'll seize this opportunity by sp uh, speeding up good production and marketing using information and genomic technologies, thus boosting sales and profit, creating jobs for young people and making goat meat more affordable. Our long-term objective is to venture into the whole goat meat uh, business chain from production, butchering, packaging, and distribution. Our, in our venture, we are committed to reducing enviro environmental degradation in uh, fragile uh, ecosystems. Initially, we'll buy, start by buying wholesale goats at $32 each, sell them at a retail price of from $75 to $100, in big cities and towns, I will make an average net profit of 38 each goat after expenses. Market sizes, Kenya has a population of about 57.1 million people and consumers of goat is about 15 million. And uh, there's not much data, but the survey I did, I put those numbers together uh, uh, to get that. Competition is generally unorganized, mostly in uh, arid areas where purchasing and marketing of goats is done by middle level actors We'll raise our own high quality goats in large numbers, maintain high sanitary standards, contact livestock feds to train our young people in goat care, deworming, crossbreeding. We'll partner with other small farmers in community settings to train them in improving uh, their goat production and then buy from them. For with the forged money of uh, uh, five uh, uh, seven thousand, we'll use two thousand three hundred to buy an all-terrain vehicle, uh, which is important in uh, in these rural areas to simply walk around, help us walk around the hundred acres of uh, goat farm. We'll spend three thousand four hundred to buy one hundred and six goats wholesale at thirty-two dollars each. The balance of about one one thousand eight hundred will go to operating costs and other expenses, and as a safety net. 106 goats at wholesale price of uh, 3,400 will bring 8,480 in three weeks. We'll keep reinvesting that money minus expenses. And uh, the forge, uh, forge grant price of three, uh, 7,500 will gradually become a budding tree for new life for many young people. My wife has a master's in nonprofit and public administration. administration with over 20 years experience. I'm majoring in communication, a minor in leadership with about 25 years experience in entrepreneurship management and business ownership. And I was once uh, for several years a youth pastor. Do you remember the story of Jane that I told you in the beginning, asking us for work? She's only one among 37 point million young Kenyans between 18 and 35, mostly unemployed, feeling marginalized, no access to opportunities, uh, re representation or participation. No wonder over 50% of all convic convicted criminals in Kenya are young people between 16 and 25. These young people are not out of control or in need of a handout, as I erroneously thought before. I see in them a reflection of a younger me, a need for someone to listen, to trust, to draw them to the love of Christ through sacrificial service. Now that you understand what goats go to do with it, please call, come along with us in combating joblessness and hopelessness among young people in Kenya, leveraging their creative energy to generate vitally needed income. Thank you. All right. Now we all know what goats got to do with it. <laughs> Thank you, Samuel. That was really great. Um, judges, you have four minutes for Samuel. Hey Samuel, this is John Halverson. I'll go first this time. Yeah. Um, really good presentation. I love that your joblessness and underemployment and 
is uh, is a huge issue in East Africa, Kenya, and beyond. So I, I think it's a worthy problem to tackle. Um, I'm wondering about the size of your vision. It seems like um, you know there's you know millions of people, as you referenced, that need good jobs. Um, tell me how big this could be. Um, you know, two, three, four years out. You know, what's, uh, will you be, will you own a farm? Will you be involved in value added, say processing goat meat or, you know, distributing milk? Um, you know, tell me a bit more about the size of the vision and why it's gonna help tackle this huge problem. Yeah, right now, actually, we went back home and we fenced uh, like five acres of land. It's something we're already doing. And we divided it into portions and we have about 40 goats right now. So what I'm trying to do is get young people to first start buying goats wholesale in a small way. Then we'll, and we'll uh, get bigger as we get more money. And then we can get the community uh, to, to join us and help uh, also other farmers produce better goats. So these young people, we can work with university students, vets who can come help us. Uh, know how to produce goats in a better way. And we, the growth is just limitless the way I see it. I just want to start small with a few young people and really invest myself with them. And uh, working with different people, that's what I'm looking for. The vision is big, but that's what draws people. So I'm um, really uh, something that I know has to happen, will happen. Sati Sana. Yeah. Samuel, uh, um, this is Ben. I just want to jump in here. Great job. I'm very, very excited. I think that I, I love goat meat. Um, I'm your, I would sign up. Give me a goat. Have, have, um, you, tried, have you tried goat meat? Sorry, yes. It's one of my favorite. Goat brochettes, uh, ragu de chev. Uh, it's go. the best. I love it. <laughs> um, it, it's a question I had is actually brought up in one of the question and answer comments too, as uh, Nathan brought up, and the same as I had is that um, you talked about next generation or genomic research. You had this idea of tech. Yeah. And then you didn't really mention it again. Do you have a patent on some technology? Do you have some, um, what, what kind of knowledge or background do you have in that? Or who's going to provide that? Could you expand on that a little bit? We have, we have people who are connected to universities. I know this stuff is already happening in Africa and in like in, uh, Sud I think Sudan, they're already doing it. So it's just a matter of, uh, we don't have to really know it, but uh, work together with these people. I just wanna uh, get as many people with knowledge because this knowledge is out there. And I don't know why it's not being tapped to get uh, jobs for people. I can see the opportunity. So it's just connections and I just need uh, a broader uh, uh, people who, you know, you can't do it by yourself. The bigger help you get with connections, then you can connect to other uh, resources. And just, gotcha. yeah. I, I, just because of limited time, I'm gonna jump in here. And Fred, I'm, I don't wanna steal your time too, but um, the other question I had was, you said a goat is gonna be between 75, equivalent of 75 and $150, and yet you're working with some of the poorer parts of you're targeting some of the poorer parts of Kenya yeah. are they going to have enough disposable income or do you have a model to give them loans or how do you how do you leverage that price point with the poor uh a poor target market okay that price is to start us off to get the money so when that price is not selling to the poor we'll just play the game the way it is for now then we get we build our capacity produce more so that we can do this across Kenya, even we'll, I'm looking, maybe I'm not the one who's gonna do it, next generation to Tanzania, and then bring the whole price of good meat down. So we are just starting to play the game as it is, but we're gonna change it down the road. Lovely, thank you, Samuel. Yeah, thank you. Just about at time, but Fred, if you have a question, why don't you go ahead and... Um, yeah, just a quick one. Did you say you have um, some goats now and, and are um, raising some? Yeah, we are. And yeah, and actually a vet comes over and we have a worker. And the thing is rolling. Like, it's the COVID thing that held us down. 
We would have gone back there already with my wife. And, and so you already have, um, I assume you've hired somebody who manages this and are already bringing youth in to train? We haven't got the youth because we are not there yet. It's not started, but we have to be there. Things in, in Africa, you have to be there. So if right. you're not there, yeah, they, they can't. Those who have been to Africa know you have to be there. And, but we just bought the goats to get it started. And uh, to, to, uh, we are trying cross breeding and uh, trying to understand the whole thing. We are close to a university where these goats are. So that's what we are doing to get okay. started. All right, thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Samuel. Appreciate that. That was a lovely presentation. Our next uh, competitor uh, and team is going to be Noah Jacobson. So I'll invite Noah to turn on his camera. Noah is a first year student in the Carlson School here at the University of Minnesota, and he is going to be pitching Arctic Solutions. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my name is Noah Jacobson, and my company is Arctic Solutions. Now, have you ever asked yourself, why am I outside in the freezing cold shoveling? Why do I spend so much time trying to start my snowblower? If you live in Minnesota, the chances you can answer yes to one or both of these questions is pretty high. I've created a solution that still provides the same great quality service as if you were to do it yourself, but you save yourself the headache and frostbitten fingers. Arctic Solutions connects shovelers to homeowners through our easy to use website on an on-demand basis. In Minneapolis, big snowplow companies have hundreds of accounts and focus on three car garage homes. Single car garage driveways downtown are left with no options and the companies never even pick up the phone because they are so busy with parking lots and homeowners associations. No one is there to serve them. This has become a huge headache for homeowners downtown and we are here to help. With over 180,000 homes in Minneapolis alone, there is plenty of need for our services. Snow removal is an $18 billion a year industry. And with the Minnesota winters coming back year after year, there is plenty of job security. With Arctic Solutions, it only takes a few clicks and a credit card and one of our shovelers will be on their way. If you are at work and you wanna clear a driveway by the time you get home, use us. If you are a thousand miles away on vacation, use us. If you wanna surprise a neighbor with snow removal services without wanting to do any of the work, use us. So no long-term contracts, no big giant companies that take hours to respond. Just homeowners getting fast and quality snow removal service. It is the easiest and warmest way to remove snow. Our target market is anyone with a one or two car garage in a densely populated area. This keeps travel time for our team members to a minimum and creates faster service times to those who we are serving. We also are targeting college towns because they have our target workers and target neighborhoods. Let's party. I'm currently a college student and understand the importance of making money. While also having an employer be flexible, a huge competitive advantage is I am amongst our target working population and live amongst the target homeowner population. We simply beat our competition because of how fast we show up, our quality of work, and immersion within the community. Our business model is simple. The shoveler gets paid per driveway to entice them to work faster for more money or allow them the flexibility to take a break if they need a rest. We believe this is a fair and sustainable way to compensate our team members. The homeowner pays a flat fee depending on the amount of snow that fell for that storm. And that number is given to them before they request a shoveler. So the more snow that falls, the more expensive it is. And the shovelers get 50% of what the homeowner pays. So the more they pay, the more the snow shoveler makes. Our goal is simple. By having team members living in every metropolitan area that receives snow so that no matter where in the state it is snowing, we are collecting revenue. Make it snow. But the goal without a plan is just a dream. That is, we have, that is why we have action steps in place to continually grow. We are constantly working on improving our technology, including website upgrades and looking into building an app for the App Store. We are going to target neighborhoods using Facebook ads and utilize the great tools of Google Ads. And speaking of great tools, let me briefly introduce the leadership team. I would not be where I am today without them. And I am so honored to be mentored by each and every single one of them. Corey in the bottom left is our website operations and logistics manager and is the director of Intellects Forensics. Wade Beavers in the top left is a business model wizard, helped youth baseball by building an entire practice facility, created four apps in the app store and has a venture capital fund. 
Finally, John Stavig of the Home Center for Entrepreneurship from the University of Minnesota has led me to lawyers, investors, mentors, and peers that have changed my life. I'd also like to mention Mike Bangasser, the CEO of Best Technology, who leads his company with a faith first mentality and has implemented that importance into me as well. I am so honored to have such a talented and humble leadership team. Our vision is simple, revolutionize the way snow removal is done in the metropolitan areas and to bring the community together in a beneficial way for everyone. Through the business of snow removal, we are joining God in his work by creating value and serving others. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. Our mission is to serve the community just as Jesus asked us to serve others. A great example for this is Chick-fil-A. They don't see their mission as creating the best chicken sandwich or fast food experience. Rather, their mission is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who came into contact with Chick-fil-A. Whether your business is chicken sandwiches or snow removal, you can still serve others and the Almighty. We serve the community by training our shovelers to look out for each other and our clients. We operate like Chick-fil-A, where the culture and customer are our number one priority. This has led Chick-fil-A to become the fastest growing fast food restaurant in the world and we look to follow in those same footsteps. We want to serve others just as Jesus served others. We believe you don't have to sacrifice growth for faith principles. A much bigger sacrifice has already been made. We are Arctic Solutions and look forward to serving you this winter season. God bless and thank you. All right, thank you, Noah. Appreciate that. Great performance and uh, presentation. Uh, judges, you have four minutes. My uh, thanks, Noah. Nice uh, presentation. Um, so, tell me more about the um, redemptive model here. Um, it, it sounds like you know you want to be like an Uber. So, are the shovelers? Um, how, how do you tell me more about how that redemptive model might work with with uh, the shovelers, for example, who aren't really employees but might just sign up? Yeah, and that's a great question. And that's something that me and my mentor, Emily, worked through for the past several months to really figure out uh, that same question and the same answer. And what we came up with was super simple. And we looked at that Chick-fil-A model as there's no Bible verses on the styrofoam cups and uh, the CEO and founder, Truett, Mr. Truett, said that that's not what we're about. We're not about Bible verses on our cups or making sure you're a Christian and giving you a discount if you go to church on Sundays. Their principle is that, you know, we believe in serving others and, and that's our redemptive qualities. You don't have to have a Bible verse on your snow shovel. Our, our redemptive part is serving the community and instilling that in our team members. They might not be a shoveler for their entire career, but at this step in their life, we want to show them the importance of serving others and treating everybody uh, that just like Jesus would treat other people with respect and kindness and just service. Okay, thanks. No, I, I, this is Ben. Thanks a lot for that. That was a very great, a great pitch. I really enjoyed it. I was thinking of the times I was out of town and I wish I had that app. So, I mean, I, I would have been a customer this year. You, I just needed the app. Um, the one, the one thing I would say is I, I would love to know um, two things. One, it, it'd be nice to know an example of uh, a price for my driveway, just roughly. Uh, and then secondly, you, you talked about like a, uh, getting these college students and my, my fear would be I'm, I'm visiting Sam in the goat farm in Kenya and I want, how do I know that you've done a good job and, and is, there, is there a quality checks? Do you have a leadership team that checks or how do you do that? Great question. Some two and questions. That we looked at, no, oh, thank you. And that's a great question. We looked at other platforms, um, sort of like Grubhub and Chick-fil-A and kind of these on-demand platforms, like how do you ensure that the job was done? And what we figured out uh, is taking pictures. So as soon as a shoveler takes care of the uh, driveway, just snap a picture, you send it to the homeowner so they know it's done, and then you send it to us so we know it's done. So everybody's on the same page of quality and making sure uh, the job gets done. And then for your first question about pricing, uh, we start at $44.99 uh, for that one two-car garage in the downtown area. And we target our marketing so we don't get 
some driveway that is like eight car garages, right? So we were specific targeting so we don't get those people and it's downtown starts at 44.99 and that goes anywhere from zero to four inches. And then from four to six, we increase by $10 uh, every two inches and that continues on. And just to follow, sorry, John, just one real quick. I'm, I'm going to start with that, but like, how does that, how does that compare to, and I know that you've had a competitive advantage, like advantage with the big guys, you know, bringing in their trucks and bringing it out. What would be the price point difference between you and a guy with a, a Ford F-250 coming and plowing up my driveway? Yeah, I know. Again, great question. Assuming that he does do it for you, because a lot of these trucks, they won't even touch if it's a single car garage. They don't want to get out of their trucks, shovel the sidewalks. Um, but if they were to do it, uh, they charge about between 50 and $60 from the zero to four. So we're beating them by about $15, um, which is pretty big, especially if you only start at 44. So, and then up that's great. That's great. Thanks a lot, Noah. Yeah. Yeah. A couple things. Uh, um, I think this model is, uh, you can learn a lot from the, there's tons of college painting businesses. And, uh, and that's kind of established and, you know, it's, it's a similar kind of target labor force and lots to learn there and they're very successful, some of them. And you have a great team, congratulations on that. Um, you know, it, this seems like the kind of business that uh, two things it would be app-based would be critical, I think, just to be able to, you know, have people sign up and, and kind of meet supply and demand real time. And so the cost of getting a function, high functioning app, what's, what's the consideration there? Number one and number two, how do you manage kind of the uneven nature of when the snow is gonna fall and you know, get, getting the troops ready last minute um, on a regular basis, often in the middle of the night probably, um, to make it a, a, a scalable model? Yeah, great questions. To answer your first one of the cost of an app, um, it depends. I mean, you can get an app from anywhere from $10,000 and some apps are a quarter of a million dollars. Um, but right now we have been able to do a proof of concepts and we are just using our website. So it's fully functional, just like an app would. It just requires a little bit more input on the back end. But right now we're fully functional with just our website, both as a worker employee and as a customer. Yeah, to prove that concept. Um, and then answering your app question, we could get one fully functional that just we need uh, for about 15,000, uh, which is okay because we already have that income from the website. And to answer the second question of readying the troops, uh, luckily with today's technology and radar, uh, you know when a snow, snowstorm is coming about three days prior. Uh, so you don't exactly know down to the 10th of an inch but you know if you're gonna get snow and that gives us a good amount of time to make sure that everybody's ready to go uh, for that snowstorm so that everything can be uh, executed flawlessly. All right. So Thank you guys. what do you do? Sorry, one really quick question. What yes. do you do in the off season? Great question. That's something that we've been figuring out just because we were so focused on snow removal. Uh, but now that it's warming up right now, we're doing um, lawn care and getting into lawn care. Again, if someone's on vacation and just needs it for one week, this is, this is where you go. This is us. So we'll take care of lawns and we can do it anywhere in the state because everybody has a lawnmower. So that's our model for the summertime. All right. Great job, Noah. Appreciate it. I'd like now to invite Hunter Bracado and Kathy Nielsen, who are going to be pitching Lions Fire Pizza. Hunter is a MBA student at the Carlson School and a, a fellow in their social entrepreneurship program. And Kathy works as a coach at a local um, high school. So thank you both and take it away. All right. Hey, we are Lions Fire, and we're excited to share with you guys today. So I am Hunter, and I am one of the co-founders of Lions Fire. And I'm Kathy Nielsen. I'm a co-founder of Lions Fire, and I'm also the head volleyball coach at Minneapolis North Community High School. Two other important members of our team that we want to mention are Lexi Holman and Zuri Ransom. They're student managers who have been with us since the beginning of our project. 
As I said, I'm the coach at Minneapolis North Community High School for volleyball. And over the years, I have uh, learned that players often struggle to choose between working to provide for themselves and participating fully and freely in volleyball and other extracurricular activities at school. In the fall of 2019, I started asking more questions of the players and um, started asking if there was something we could do to help address the challenges that they constantly face. I knew I had the privilege of understanding their story. I had some skills making pizza that I thought might uh, blend well. And what I didn't have was business experience and that's where Hunter came in. That's right. And so in the spring of 2020, uh, Lions Fire, a mobile wood-fired pizza biz, uh, tailor-made for female student athletes in North Minneapolis was born. And so you can picture us a little bit. Here are, here are a few pictures uh, of us in our pilot that we did last fall. Now we'll really start uh, talking about the business a little bit. So there at the beginning, we conducted a, a variety of interviews. And like I said, uh, also conducted a, an initial pilot, really just to understand uh, the two people groups that we were seeking to serve, which would be our student employees, and then also, of course, our pizza customers. So I just want to highlight a couple of things that we learned um, from both those interviews and uh, that pilot. So uh, we learned that our female student athletes, they really need uh, an employment opportunity that is tailor-made for them, that's growth-focused. One uh, quote that, that really resonated with us was that these other places, these other places that we worked, uh, they don't care like they do at my current employer. At these other places, you're just another employee. And for the income for now and later piece is really speaking to what Kathy was talking about, uh, this tension between uh, trying to provide for yourself, but also uh, participate fully and freely uh, in your sport of choice. And so that's really uh, the two needs that we're seeking to, to um, address in our business for our uh, student employees. And from a pizza customer perspective, we learned through these experiences that really it's not so much about the food, it's not so much about the pizza, but it's about the experience, it's about the connection of bringing people together uh, for something exciting. And our on-site catering experience does exactly that. And then the, the, the cherry on top for that is really the opportunity to be associated with something bigger than themselves, something part of the community, something that's mission-driven. People like to feel good about what they're buying. We like to call it pizza with the purpose. <clears throat> and so through those learnings, we've really kind of put together this, this model um, for our student employees and our pizza customers. So I'll start with the student employees. So in the late spring, what we're planning to do is to offer soft skills and pizza training, which will be paid uh, to our student employees, uh, really preparing them for the summer programming where um, they will receive an above average wage for their work and really that supportive on the job coaching environment that's distinct from a lot of the employee uh, employment that they're currently receiving. And then lastly, to really address that, how do I work and go to school and play volleyball or whatever sport it is in the fall, offering some sort of deferred stipend in the fall to address that issue. And from a pizza customer perspective, it's pretty simple. It's hopefully really good pizza. Uh, it's on-site catering uh, for local organizations and private events. Uh, and, it, and it's top-notch customer service uh, for uh, those folks. And really want to point out that what makes our business model unique, we believe, is obviously the mobility of it, um, but also just the radical generosity that's really at the foundation of it, which will uh, be a little bit more clear as I talk through this slide a little bit. So uh, we're planning to, to charge uh, a minimum of $1,500 uh, as a minimum per event. And, and uh, based on our pilot this past fall, we realized that our cost of goods sold per event, including labor wages, is somewhere between uh, $600 to $900, obviously giving us a good margin there for our events. And with the plan to do 20 to 30 events, which would be two to three events per week uh, for 10 weeks over the summer, that gives us an opportunity to generate quite a bit of revenue. To the generosity piece, I uh, wanna note that volunteering is a big part of our model. Uh, we are both volunteered, we are volunteers, we volunteered all of our time thus far. And for our events, uh, usually our crews are uh, six people and three of those are volunteers from kind of our personal networks. And then three of those will be student employees. 
Another piece of this radical generosity is that the pizza trailer that we, we use was actually generously donated to us. So that's not a cost that we have to worry about. And so again, all of this cost savings really positions us uh, to have stronger profits. And, and that's important, not because we care about making a lot of money, but because it enables us to focus on the needs of our student employees, whether that be uh, paying them a, a highly competitive wage or whatever programming it is uh, that we would like to deliver um, to again, address those needs. And this graphic just helps to point out a few of those things, right? So if we don't include uh, student wages, you'll see that revenue can be up to three times greater uh, than annual costs without our student wages. Uh, and then even if you include those student wages, there's still quite a bit of margin in our model. And feel free, of course, to ask some questions about that. The last thing that I wanted to point out is that um, we all of this was based on a pilot. And so we're excited about this opportunity to partner with Forge, whereby we can really scale up um, to a sustainable business uh, model. And so um, one thing, I was oh, sorry about that. One thing I wanted to add uh, was the competitive landscape of what we've done. And so um, if you think about, if you're gonna, if you're a local organization or you're a private event host, trying to figure out what type of option you're gonna provide. These would be kind of the different ways that you could think about that option. And um, <clears throat> the, the piece that we feel like we're able to deliver on are kind of the classic pieces of the dining industry in terms of the cost and quality and service. But then where we feel like we really stick out is to be able to provide this on-site, flexible, um, unique experience connected to uh, a mission, this pizza with a purpose that people are going to be excited to be a part of. And so kind of with that purpose aspect, I'll pass it over to Kathy to finish things off. Hunter's done a good job of telling you about uh, our business model, but what's most important to us is our story and the story of the young pizza heroes that we work with. Our name came from the African proverb, until the lion has his or her own historian, the hunter will always be the hero. For us, the lion is the one whose side of the story is not often heard. Those are our employees. The fire is a creative tool that we're using to share and restore the stories of our employees, our volunteers, and the communities that we touch. We're grateful to be a part of that story. We understand it's a privilege, and we're grateful to tonight share that a little bit of that story with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Way to go, Hunter and Kathy. We really appreciate that. Thanks, Trevor. Welcome back, our Forge judges. I'm I'm hungry. I just I, I just <laughs> needed to throw. I'm, I want. I was actually. I'm like. I need a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably make that happen. I like it. I like it. Well, I'll just jump in. I'm Ben. Thanks for thanks for this pitch. This is really great. I love the I love that redemptive vision of like the specific target market that you're you're doing, and I really I really like that. I think again, I would I would. My, my main question, though, comes back into uh, the leadership of this. And I know that you're, two, you're both volunteering. And one of the things that I've just seen through different organizations is when it's volunteer-led, sometimes it just kind of falls off. Like there's nobody driving, driving this in two years and three years. So is this something you're going to scale? Is this just a kind of a pet project that you're going to keep running? How do you, how do you manage the long-term leadership of this? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so I think our, I, I know our vision for long-term leadership would be, you know, we mentioned Zuri and Lexi at the beginning. And um, I also run another small profit in the neighborhood. And so I have a very set sort of timeline in my head that I'm open to flexing, but I, but I have it in mind. Um, I, our hope would be that, you know, this is an actual uh, workable business model when even if you extract the volunteer piece, um, but I, I hope uh, as we build over the years, this will be a sustainable model. And um, the honest answer is I hope one of the young women who have been part of it will be the driving force behind it. Zuri in particular has a, a really deep interest in that, in that, so. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, hey, I, I love the impact, uh, you know, helping kids with meaningful work and then, uh, you know, being able to do sports and do things that are super important for them. Um, it's just awesome. Um, on your business, I, uh, I'm wondering about just kind of some couple things. 
you know, managing a food service business with volunteers and no full-time staff, how are you going to maintain food safety, quality standards, so your brand isn't hurt, uh, number one. Number two, your costs seem to focus mainly on labor, but what about pizza and uh, the pizza ingredients and, and all of those factors? And I'll say this, uh, it's okay to have part of your model be, we're gonna raise grant capital or subsidies to just in, in terms of revenue plus that, if that's what you're thinking will make it sustainable. But those are my questions. Sure, yeah, thanks John for the questions. First of all, I mean, that's definitely been something that we've thought about is, uh, you know, what will the funding model be? And, and do we want to be more open to grant-based funding or something of that sort? Right now we're being really aggressive in, in thinking about how can we make this basically as independent uh, as it possibly can? And we feel like kind of this generosity aspect of other ways that we're thinking about it might enable us to do that. But definitely uh, thank you for that feedback. So I think on the, for your first question, one thing that's important to note is that this is a seasonal thing. So we're trying to do it in the summers. And so Kathy uh, and myself, but especially Kathy is committed to uh, really driving this in the summers. And, and the second aspect of that is that we're not trying to have, you know, four or five events a week. We talk to other folks that run their pizza trucks. Sometimes they have two to three events per day. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to do two to three events per week. So what that looks like is you have, um, if you do an event, say on Wednesday and Thursday, you do uh, you know, prep from 10 to two uh, on those two days, or the, the working hours would be 10 to two uh, on that Tuesday and Wednesday, and whatever dough prep you needed to do earlier in the week for that. Uh, an additional kind of aspect of that is just having a commissary kitchen uh, that um, kind of enables um, you to have that space that's shared and a lot of the infrastructure that you would need um, is already in place for you, but you're not entirely responsible for it. So trying to minimize as much as we can in that regard. I hope that answered your first question. Um, can you remind me of the, the second one? Pizza cost. Oh, the pizza cost, yeah, thank you. Uh, so that, that cost that I included um, did include pizza costs. That's one of the beauties of pizza is it's actually pretty darn cheap to make. So we can make a pizza, don't tell anybody, <laughs> but we can make a really good pizza for about $2 a pizza. That's, so, a, that's high. Actually. Yeah, you could probably make it for under $2 a pizza and it'd still be pretty darn good. So if you have, um, say we're making, so when we say $1,500 a bit, we're saying either $15 per pizza or we're saying $10 per pizza and a $500 service fee. So if you're, the margins there include uh, the price of the pizza and then the cost of labor uh, in, in that number. Great, thanks. So your primary uh, redemptive model here is the, when you talk about being mission driven, that's really the primary um, redemptive model of the um, group of young people that you're working with, is that, could you say more about that? Yeah, I, you know, Fred, I, I think what we've learned is that um, one, of, one of my favorite quotes is that transformation is exquisitely mutual. So yes, we are, our hope would be that this is redemptive in the lives of the young women. It, it, it certainly addresses a, a genuine felt need. Um, they carry much more than uh, young women their age should, and we're pleased to be able to step into that with them. Um, what's also true is that Hunter and I are <laughs> different than we were a year and a half ago. The volunteers that have participated and the people at the events, when they um, ask the young women questions as they're serving them, when they begin to, if you take that proverb, when they understand a story in a way that they've never heard before, it, it changes, I think, all of us. And um, our prayer would be that it changes the community. Yeah. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Hunter and Kathy, and thank you, judges. And now we're here with our final uh, team. I'm going to invite Ethan and Luke onto the uh, turn on their camera here. All right, welcome, Ethan and Luke. Ethan and Luke are uh, undergraduates at the University of uh, Minnesota, and they're going to be pitching piecemeal.
Take it away, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Travis. All right. Let me get the. Yep. All right, so before we even start, um, I want to introduce you to someone we met called, we'll call her T. And although she's not in this picture here, this is where she lives for a part of the year. T is one of the many people we met for an interview about our venture. We sat outside with her outside Amundsen Hall at the U of M to hear her story. She is one of 8,000 homeless in Minneapolis. With her entire life packed into a cart, she has no place to cook food or keep things refrigerated. Both Ethan and I have walked by that spot outside Amundsen every year since we started coming to the U, and we've seen her out there even in the snow. The thing is that she is not the only one. We see beggars outside the Target in Dinkytown, the CVS and Walgreens, and even at the light rail stations. So this is Ethan and I'm Luke. We're both undergraduate students studying computer science with a heart for our community. We both see the needy in our community and want to help. You could donate to a charity, but there's very little visibility in how you helped. You could also give cash to someone, but there's no accountability on how it's spent. We spent time interviewing students on campus about their philosophy to give, and they answered, I have been advised to give food and other items to support the homeless, but not money. Supporting the homeless keeps people on the streets. However, everyone needs food, and I'd rather give them food than money. Inspired by our findings and our own hearts, we are creating an app called Piecemeal to help the hungry and address the conviction within ourselves when we pass by someone begging for food and don't know how to help. With Piecemeal, you can see who you are donating to and the food that you're helping them buy. To illustrate what a possible use case might be, we have a mock-up of how our app will operate. I'll demonstrate what it looks like from both the recipient and the donor's perspective when using Piecemeal. So say I'm homeless or in need and I'm hungry, I'm looking for a hot meal. Um, I open up the piecemeal app and I have a list of restaurants here I can choose from that are nearby. Say I want to go to Wally's and I have a list of food items. Uh, I feel like having a euro. So once I've selected a food item, I can request it and then head over to my dashboard. And the dashboard will show my current request along with um, a progress meter of how much that request has been fulfilled and then a QR code, which allows donors passing by to contribute to my request. So now I'm a donor and I've just scanned the QR code. This will pull up a screen either on my app if I already have it or on a web page so I don't have to download an app. I can select a preset amount to donate or I could just enter my own. Finally, there's the piecemeal tip, which helps us generate revenue. It defaults at 10%, but as a donor, I can choose to increase this amount or take it away completely. Once I'm satisfied with the amount I'm donating, I can tap donate and I can donate with my preferred uh, method of payment. Yeah, so as you saw in the demo, donors are presented with the option of donating a 10% adjustable amount to piecemeal directly. And these donations are pretty small, 10 cents if you donate a dollar and more will cover the operating costs of the app. Our operating costs are completely dependent on the technology we decided to use. Besides the app, which is hosted in the app store for free and our real-time database storing user accounts and restaurant information, spending on APIs to expand our functionality and money to fund development, those are our only costs. To give a little more detail, our spending on a database will be $5 per month and can support up to 2 million users based on one kilobyte of metadata per user. So we show here in this chart a little bit of the revenue balancing out operating costs based on the survey data that we took, um, based on people willing to donate $10 a month and 10% tip coming out of that. A portion of our prize money will go towards supporting these costs if we're not meeting that from the donations right away. In this donation space, we have no direct competition. There's currently no other group applying technology in the same way that we are in addressing food insecurity. And if there were, we would be happy. However, that does not mean piecemeal faces no resistance. We foresee a couple of barriers to adoption. There are always those who simply do not want to or cannot afford to give to the homeless. This is something that piecemeal will not be able to solve. For those that do have it in their hearts and wallets to give, many of them are used to giving cash. So the adoption and learning of a new method such as piecemeal may be hard. Finally, another challenge we face is marketing the app and bringing it to both donors and recipients. In comparison to charity organizations, 
we have a competitive advantage over them. Our app is a more direct and intentional way to give to the needy. Unlike big charities, our app does not have all the overhead. So most, if not all of the donation money actually goes to the people who need it most. People don't like to use cash these days, but our app leverages the increasing popularity of touch-free payments, which have, been, which have seen increasing rates of usage, especially overseas. And as such, our app is keeping up with current and advancing technology. We know that students especially like using services such as Venmo and Cash App, and piecemeal fits right in. By decreasing the friction people often experience when giving directly to the homeless, we can give people a way to do what they feel convicted to do. Right, so right now we're in phase one of our development, which is basically working on the core functionality of our app and allowing users to request food and then donors to donate money. Uh, phase two of our development will be giving the app an interface for donors as well as recipients so that donors can find and select recipients to donate to. This way, donors can keep a profile in our app and be encouraged by seeing the change that they're making. And finally, we'd like to add new app functions like budgeting to make donating easier and more effective. A portion of our prize money will go towards supporting these development plans. Lastly, um, we would like to spread beyond the U of M campus and advertise our app through social media, um, maybe news outlets, so that people will be aware of it and spread it to the needly and uh, homeless so that they can use it as well. We know the technology and we are a part of this community. We've watched this city and this campus grow over the years and we want to give back through piecemeal. We believe in the good of people and that people genuinely want to help others. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Well done, Ethan. Well done, Luke. Uh, what a creative idea. Um, welcome back to our judges. And what questions do you have for our competitors? Um, yeah, this is Fred. I'll ask a quick question. Have you um, done any um, interviews or work with the homeless to get their um, view on using this or how this might work? Yeah, we have. We've interviewed some of the homeless around the U of M campus, and we found that uh, about two thirds of them have access to the internet or have a smartphone, so they'll be able to use this. And many of them, like we talked about in our story, aren't able to store hot foods and they don't have a place to cook food either. So this is something that is very important to them on a daily basis. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Ethan and Luke. This is this is Ben. Uh, great, great pitch. I really think you did a good job on the uh, uh, just visually. It's really understandable, and I, I really appreciate that. One thing that you didn't really get into too much is um, the revenue model, and, and and I know that this is very heavily in the redemptive um, zone. But I see that, like, I'm assuming just from the pitch that the revenue really comes through that tip, and I'm assuming like is that a hundred percent of your revenue is just out of that tip? Or will you also get some of the revenue from the actual money donated for food? That's the first question. And then the second question is, you know, do you have a model for what you like projections on growth in that area? Yeah, thanks for the question. So the revenue, we are basing it on tip right now. Um, we're basing it on, first of all, our costs, I should talk about. Our costs are really dependent on how many users there are and how much data we need to host in the back end. And that's actually really scalable. So we talked about like $5 a month. That's based on uh, two gigabytes of storage back end. But really the only thing we're storing is how much account balance a person has, you know, so they can't just change their own account balance on their own device and then get a meal out of it. So that's very little data that we need per user. And then in terms of API, that's when we expand more. So one of the APIs we're thinking about is called Foursquare. And that's gonna provide more rich contextual information about places and restaurants and things like that. But that's only gonna be needed later on when we have expanded to other cities and need to support more people. Uh, so we are, we are hoping that a 10 cents you know, on the dollar will not be too much of a donation, uh, too much of a hassle if you're donating a dollar to someone in need. And that is our, that is our operating model right now for revenue. Yep. And the reason why we want the tip to come um, not out of the cost of the donation is we don't want to be taking money from the recipients. So, yep. yeah, quick question. Yeah, um, 
I'm not sure I understood exactly how uh, the meal is picked up and, and, and put into the hands of the homeless recipient. Yeah, when they it look, it look pretty amazing, they can order from restaurants in close vicinity. Is that right? Yep. And someone then can pay for it. Does that person go get it and give it to them? Or does the homeless person get a credit and go pick it up? Or how does that work? Yeah, so one of the people we interviewed in Dinky Town, um, he told us stories about how other homeless sometimes go to specific restaurants that leave out food, uh, extra food that they have and just give to the homeless. And so that could be an idea where um, we're communicating with the restaurants directly and the homeless or whoever's using the app can go to that restaurant and pick it up themselves as one method. Yeah, I think, I think that's super interesting in that, you know, America has super strict like ridiculously strict food safety regulations and so much good food is thrown out. So, you know, therein is, should be a, a, a big opportunity it would probably involve changing the regulatory environment. But I mean, it's tragic that you have people that are food insecure and hungry with so much extra food that's there that's often thrown out. So there's, there, there seems like a really interesting opportunity for sure. Hey, I love that you did your market research and really talked to the folks that you're trying to help. I think that is going to feed your model very intelligently. And uh, so I just want to say thanks. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I would just, before you, we, we sign off here, I just want one, one other um, question would be, and I think it was in one of the questions as well, is how do you, how do you um, sign up people for the app? And uh, like, how do you um, advertise this? to the homeless and the needy. And the question was, how do you get people who don't need it to sign up? But I think that's just uh, probably something that's gonna happen regardless. But yeah, how do you target, like this target market of the homeless, how do you get the word out? Okay, that's a great question. So I'm gonna just first pick on the low hanging fruit and answer, how do we get the donors to be a part of this, right? So um, the idea is that the, the person who is in need will have the app and they'll be able to generate a QR code from their request. And then anyone passing by, they don't need the app at all. Instead, they can just scan the QR code with their camera function and it will bring up a little weblet or web page for the payment. So they don't need to have anything installed or an account made um, right now. Instead, they can just scan the QR code and pay. As for adoption, um, I'd like to add that um, the, more, the more donors that know about this, the easier it is to get it out to recipients and homeless as well. Because um, say the next time a donor uh, is encountered by um, a homeless asking for money, uh, they, say, they say, do you have the app piecemeal? And then even if, even if that homeless person doesn't have the app and the donor moves on, you know, that will be in the homeless person's mind. It's like, what is this app piecemeal? Maybe next time they'll download it and see what it is. Yeah, we just hope that it would act as a as a, something of credibility. You know, people will be willing to donate into that. Awesome, great job, everybody. Uh, so we've had six really terrific pitches. I, I um, don't know about you, but I wish we could uh, support them all with grand prizes. Uh, but sadly, we cannot. So at this point, we're going to have a time of tabulating of scores. Uh, our judges are going to. Uh, rank order each of our participants in three different categories in terms of their uh, their pitch delivery, the, the content of their pitch from a business uh, development angle, and the content of their pitch from a redemptive entrepreneurship or redemptive vision angle. Uh, and so during that time, I'm going to share a brief vision video of Anselm House. For those of you who are new to us, uh, you'll get a, a little bit of a sense of, of what we're about. That will give us time to make sure that all the um, votes are tabulated. If you're joining us, uh, you know, virtually and you want to uh, put in a vote for your favorite team for the Audience Choice Award of an extra $500, I invite you to go to forgecompetition.com forward slash vote. That's forgecompetition.com forward slash vote. So at this point, we'll just show, show a brief video, two and a half minutes long, and then we'll come back and announce our winners. You are a whole person. Your interests, your character, what you love, and what you think. 
your studies, your work, your beliefs. Each is a part of you, and the parts must connect to tell your whole story. But so often, we don't live that way. We keep parts of ourselves separate. We compartmentalize, not connecting the dots. We think my faith belongs at church. My intellect belongs at school. Work is for the office. Prayers are for the pew. And all of me doesn't quite fit anywhere. The university is a place designed for integration, to connect all fields of knowledge. It's what the Latin word universitas means, entirety, the totality, whole. Yet, study today is so specialized, students are so departmentalized, knowledge has become technical and separated from the human, and faith is dismissed. Living this divided life is exhausting. It's dissatisfying. And though we think that separating parts of ourselves might better protect each of them, we really just end up undermining all of them. Because here's the thing, God designed us to be whole. There's no part of us that doesn't work together for our good, his good, and the greater good. In Christ, all things hold together. And this is the pursuit of Anselm House, to create a place and build a community that approaches all of life as a whole. A university community that is dedicated to inquiry and relationship, faith and knowledge, where our thinking and our living build character. A community that loves to learn while together learning to love. A community that helps the university and all the leaders that it sends out to flourish. And this community needs you at our table, in our reading groups, your questions at our forums, your voice in our scholarship, your tradition in our prayers, because you are a whole person. And we seek to be a whole community where knowledge, work, faith, and character realize their full dimension by coming together as a whole. All right, uh, let's see. Sorry, I have to now, I have to make sure that everything's in the correct place before I do this. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so thank you all for your votes. Uh, we now have tabulated all the winners. And, you know, I wish we all could be here together to feel the suspense in the air. I know you feel it uh, wherever you are. First, I'm going to go ahead and share our audience uh, choice award. This is the, the choice that's selected by you all uh, who are viewing right now your favorite presentation. And before I do that, let's bring every all the contestants back on. Go ahead and turn on your videos so we can all be here together. And... How about the, the judges too? So we can all, all be here together in the, the room. Go ahead and turn on your video. Just a little added moment of suspense. Okay, so our audience choice award winner for tonight is Light in the Well. Congratulations, Wu. You got our uh, audience choice. Very cool. And now, the grand prize as chosen by our Forge judges goes to Lion's Fire. Way to go, Kathy and Hunter. So, oh. wow. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we don't know what to say. Wow, thank you. <laughs> and let me just reiterate um, how amazing all of the the contestants did and the the high quality i don't know if the judges want to speak to that um go ahead and uh speak into this group yeah i'll just say i thought everyone did an outstanding job and <clears throat> i don't want anyone to leave discouraged it was uh love to see your hearts and your minds coming together 
which I, which I think is redemptive business. And, uh, you know, if anything, I would challenge you to really, uh, get granular on, on, on kind of the financial progression and growth strategies. And, you know, strategy always has to be married up to a good, uh, financial model. And, uh, and that'll help you sustain your growth and figure out how much money you need up front and that sort of thing. But I, uh, I want to say congratulations to everybody just because uh, you're on the right path of making a significant difference. And the sheer exercise of doing this was already going to serve you well. So I'm just honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Absolutely. Fred, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, likewise, I'm... I'm um, happy and honored to have a, had a chance to do this. Um, I would have liked to have talked to each of you for about 30 minutes, but um, um, you know, I, having judged lots of these, don't regardless of how you do, this is just one day and it's just how the three of us perceive you. And so um, if you, um, you should just take this, as that and, and recognize that that you're all doing really good work and and just keep pushing on it. Um, it's it's all about perseverance. So good luck and happy to help if any of you ever want to reach out. Yeah, I would say that this you guys have all done an amazing job. This is this is great. And I know from firsthand experience what it's like to um, pitch things and, and, and go, go after your dream. And, and it, a dream that if you just develop a few of the, just the intricacies, well, like John said, the business model, uh, or, you know, just some more examples of how this is going to look or what is the, what the functionality. Uh, I think that each of your ideas is, is valuable. Everything from woo, your like my kids are in therapy and I'm like, I could use this to, to Noah. I wish I had that app up to those two months ago to Sam. I love goat. I, I want to eat your supply. Um, and I'm not a vet, but I can still remember 200 pounds. That's, that's a per, like the 200 dog thing. It's just, I think that each of you, there's a, and, and then Ethan and Luke, just, just that intrinsic, um, just like, well, how do I help? You know? And I think, so I think every, everyone has set up a, a compelling story. And I think you guys have done a great job. I'm glad that I could hear these out and I can't wait to see each of your businesses um, success I guess maybe it'll have to be a pizza first Hunter and Kathy <laughs> awesome well let me just say once again thank you to all of our participants um, and I really was blessed myself to hear these stories and, and these ideas and, and wish you all success and um, also thank our, our mentors and our partnering organizations and our especially our judges tonight, who I think gave really helpful feedback in the process of asking hard questions and good questions. And so uh, thank you also to everybody who's, who's joining us um, online or, or who will be watching this later. Um, if you want to learn more about Anselm House, go to anselmhouse.org. We do have some fun summer events coming up that I'd like to just tell you about. One in particular is Summer Sessions, which is going to be a short intensive time of, um, of formation and fellowship around three topics, uh, love and justice in the Christian tradition, how to read the Old Testament and faith and knowledge in public, uh, in, a, in a pluralistic society. And so if any of those sound interesting to you, maybe on our website, you can sign up for our email and, and we'll send you more information about those in the future. Uh, if you have questions or wanna learn more about any of our participants or wanna be connected to our participants in some way for some reason, uh, I invite you to send your questions to uh, forge at anselmhouse.org and we can, we can help you do that. So thank you all once again and thank you to the participants and now we can get, each give ourselves a round of applause. God bless. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.